We are under the illusion that we are emerging from the pandemic. I hope that illusion will become reality. And as we do, we should not simply wish to reestablish the status quo, certainly from our analyses in the UK and in England specifically that I'm going to focus on here. The status quo before the pandemic was far from ideal. We should not simply wish to return to the status quo. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. Particularly in a pandemic, the healthcare system looms very large. And of course, it is very important and it gets more important as people get older. But my focus largely is on the conditions that make people sick in the first place. Before the pandemic crashed upon us, in February 2020, I produced this report, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. I need to go back a bit to explain. I had chaired the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We published in 2008, and the then UK Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, asked me, could we translate the findings and recommendations of your global commission for one country, England? And I conducted a new review, the Marmot Review. We published it as Fair Society, Healthy Lives in February 2010. So in February 2020, we published the Marmot Review 10 years on. What had happened in the decade since I made a set of recommendations on how we could improve health and reduce inequalities in health? And my simple answer was, we have lost a decade and it shows. If we look at the life expectancy in, the, in England, the UK as well, it had been increasing about one year every four years for women and for men. I've taken it back to 1980. I could have gone back to 1900 and it was increasing about one year every four years. And in 2010, there was a break in the curve. The rate of increase slowed dramatically and just about ground to a halt. That all ages and much of what I'm going to say applies through the life course. All ages, but particularly a rise in mortality in older people. The government of the day, now the question is what happened in 2010? And in 2010, we had a new government, a conservative led coalition government. The government said, surely you can't be suggesting there's anything we did that might have led to this slowdown. We need to look at that question. Perhaps they said, we've simply reached peak life expectancy. It's got to slow down sometime. So we looked at other countries. Estonia, this is annual life expectancy improvement in weeks, 2011 to 2017. Estonia, Norway, Slovakia, Hungary, Denmark, Belgium, Austria, Japan, Czech Republic, UK. We had the slowest improvement of any rich country except Iceland and the United States. No, we had not reached peak life expectancy. In my 2010 Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, we had six policy domains. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all. Number four, really radical for a rich country. Everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Healthy and sustainable places and communities and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. 
do I mean by a social determinants approach to prevention? The National Health Service has an eat well guide. It recommends what you need to eat to have a nutritious diet, remain healthy. If people in the bottom 10% of household income followed the healthy eating advice, they would need to spend 74% of household income on food. These people are not acting irresponsibly. You can't blame the poor for their poor diets, blame their poverty. So what happened in 2010? The government that was elected had as an explicit mission, austerity, rolling back of the state, and they did it. In 2009-10, public sector expenditure made up 42% of gross domestic product. And that declined over the decade. So by the end of the decade, the 42% had become 35%. They really did reduce public expenditure. They really did roll back the state. In my 2010 review, we coined the rather awkward term, proportionate universalism. We were trying to combine targeted approaches, which target the worst off, with a more Scandinavian approach of a universalist approach. So we're trying to combine them. Because there is a social gradient, the less the deprivation the better the health, the longer the life expectancy. If you only target people at the bottom, you miss the health disadvantage of people higher up the gradient. So we wanted universalist approaches with effort proportionate to need. What did we get after 2010? This is council spending per person. Look first at the gray bars, that's total local authority spending per person. In the least deprived, 20% of areas, spending per person went down by 16%. And then the greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction in spending. This is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could that have played a role in worsening health and bigger inequalities? Yeah, I think it could. And look at adult social care, particularly affecting older people. The decline was 3% in spend per person in the least deprived, and then the greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction, 16% reduction. Particularly during the pandemic, we all wrung our hands and said, oh my gosh, a crisis in social care, we've got to do something about it. But for a decade, there was a reduction in spending on adult social care affecting older people. And it was regressive. The greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction. Let me start for a moment at the other end of the life course, childhood. What happened from 2010? Child poverty is measured as living in a household at less than 60% median income. Before housing costs, 18% of children were in poverty in 2010-11. After housing costs, it was 27%. And over the decade, that 27% became 30%. But there's inequality in the older population too. If we look at care home residents, so these are care homes that are classified as of inadequate standard. And 
the proportion who are self-funding requires improvement and good. The better the quality of the care home, the greater the proportion who are self-funded. So people who rely on the state to fund their place in a care home have to put up with worse quality than people who are self-funded. Inequality in standard of care related to income. If we look at income poverty rates by age, in general, so this is the poverty rate on the y-axis in the population aged over 65, and this is the general population. And as you'd expect, in general, the higher the poverty rate in the general population, the higher the poverty rate in older age. But there are countries like Korea, Estonia, Latvia, Mexico, Lithuania, Israel, Great Britain, where the poverty rate in older age is in excess of what you would have predicted from the poverty rate in the general population. Countries like Brazil, interestingly, where it goes the other way. So people of older age are dis discriminated against in terms of the economic arrangements and poverty rates. Long-term care expenditure, total long-term care expenditure as a share of GDP, again from the OECD, that's the OECD average. United States, United Kingdom, Israel, very low. Interestingly, Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Now you might say, well, they've got high long-term care expenditure because they've got a lot of older people. But these same countries, the Netherlands, Denmark, if you look at a measure of quality of life in young people who are in the front rank, Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, Sweden's a bit below, but those four, um, Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, and then Finland, uh, they rank the best for young people and they have the greater long-term care expenditure. So this is actually caring for the population through the life course from young people to older ages needing care. A recent paper from some colleagues of ours looked at inequalities in dementia in the US and England by level of income first. At the highest level of income, there was essentially no difference in dementia prevalence in a representative US sample and an English sample. But the lower the income, the bigger the US disadvantage the inequalities were steeper in the US than they were in England. Hmm. And you see the same with education, the inequalities. So on average, it looks like dementia prevalence is higher in the US, but that's not the case for the least deprived. It looks like the issue is it's the inequalities in the outcome are much bigger in the US than they are in England for older people, but it's true for life expectancy as well. Health equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on, was produced, as I said, in February 2020, just before the pandemic crashed. We waited 10 years to produce that. We waited only 10 months to produce the COVID-19 Marmot Review. What we've got here is the social gradient in mortality from all causes by level of deprivation. 
classify people by where they live, classify where they live by deprivation, and the greater the deprivation, the higher the mortality. That's all causes. And this is COVID-19. We've had politicians say that the pandemic is a race between the vaccination and the virus. Yeah, that's so inadequate as an explanation. The inequalities in COVID-19 mortality look entirely similar to the inequalities in all causes mortality. In other words, the causes of inequalities in health more generally apply to COVID-19. Yes, we need to control the virus, but we also need to deal with the causes of inequalities in health. And then we had the ethnic differences in England. Compared to whites, black African women had nearly three times the mortality of COVID-19. Black African men had nearly four times. So black African, Bangladeshi, black Caribbean, Pakistani, and to a lesser extent, Indian, had much higher COVID-19 mortality than whites. Much of that excess could be accounted for by geography, where people live, crowding, deprivation, and other socioeconomic characteristics. Interestingly, for Black African and Black Caribbean, not much of the excess could be attributed to prior ill health. Although that did make a contribution in the Bangladeshi and Pakistani. Looking at this, I said, we need to deal with structural racism. And of course, in the early stage, mortality was very high in care home residents. This is the percent of care home residents who died of COVID-19, Belgium, Scotland, Slovenia, Spain, US, UK, England, Wales, Northern Ireland. Countries, of course, that controlled the pandemic well, South Korea, Singapore, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Hungary, Australia, Finland, Norway, their older people didn't have the same dreadful toll because the, overall the country controlled the pandemic. We not only didn't control the pandemic well, but we actually put people into care homes without testing. And the effect of the pandemic also to exacerbate inequalities in lack of access to treatment. It's the percent of the population with a canceled hospital treatment by deprivation. And in general, the greater the deprivation, particularly for older people, the greater the likelihood of having hospital treatment canceled. During the first phase of the pandemic, the UK had the highest excess mortality. There's some problem comparing countries because differences in the way COVID-19 finds its way onto death certificates. So one solution to this was to say, what's the excess mortality? In other words, how many deaths would you have expected in 2020? based on the mortality rates of the previous five years. How many did we see? And that's the excess. And in the early phase of the pandemic, the UK had the highest excess of any country. The United States has taken its rightful place as having that biggest excess, but ours is still pretty high. And it's a general finding. If you look at improvement in healthy life expectancy in the decade before the pandemic and the excess mortality during the pandemic, there's the US negative improvement in healthy life expectancy, so decline, and big excess mortality, the UK, fairly slow improvement, large excess mortality, and it's a negative relation. Denmark, Latvia, had improvement in healthy life expectancy in the decade before the pandemic and negative excess. Mortality was actually lower during the pandemic. And I ask myself, what's the link? I think of health as a measure of societal success. Pre-pandemic in England, life expectancy was stalling. Inequalities were increasing 
and life expectancy for the poorest people was falling. And that slowdown in life expectancy was nearly the slowest of all rich countries. And then during the pandemic, we had the highest excess mortality. What links these two? Doing poorly before and poorly during the pandemic. And I think the link could work at four levels. Poor governance and political culture, increasing social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services. We were ill prepared coming into the pandemic and we were unhealthy coming into the pandemic. So in terms of recommendations to build back fairer, I remind you that I had six domains of recommendations through the life course, early child development, education, employment and working conditions, having enough money to lead a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. But I think we also need to deal with this, these problems, the poor governance and political culture, increasing social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services, and the fact that we've not been very healthy. Often I get asked, what's the one thing you would recommend? One thing? Put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy.